Previously, we counted all lines in a one-dimensional family of quartics. Now we want to find the quartics that contain a line. Or uh, more precisely, we want to compute the values of the parameter t corresponding to the quartics that contain a line. So here's what's happening. I'm putting the base a1 with the parameter t uh, at the bottom, and I'm drawing here this a4 with the four variables aijs. So this is an I identify this with the affine chart of the Grassmannian. So I have an A4 here and an A1 here, so this is a caricature, and the A4 times A1 is represented by this rectangle. And inside of here, I have this X representing the parameter T together with the corresponding line inside uh, the quartic corresponding to the parameter T. So X, as we saw, is just a bunch of points like this. And each point in X can be seen as a tuple in AIJs and T. So it's just a point with these coordinates. What I want to see are the corresponding T values. So maybe this is T1, this is T2, etc. And we've seen that uh, in general there will be 320 points in X. We can expect that they should be from distinct quartics. And then uh, there will be, one would expect that there will be 320. 20 different values of t for these uh, different values of x. And what we want to do is to find these 320 values. Each of them corresponds to a quartic, and uh, that quartic will have a line. So let's define the following polynomial. So I just defined uh, the product of these linear factors in t with roots having these coordinates ti's coming from x. Let's just say there are 320 roots. This won't matter in the end. And the point of this pt is that it vanishes on x. Since it vanishes on all of the t coordinates of the points on x, it vanishes on x. And if we were to say it more precisely, then I would say that it vanishes on all points of x defined over q bar, so or q bar points. Uh, remember, this is actually the same as complex points, since my x was defined with q polynomials, so polynomials with rational coefficients, the points in the solution set will be defined in q bar. Now there's a way to uh, represent this pt without first finding all the points in x and then deducing the points ti's. This would be an expensive operation. There's another way to do this. And the way this works is through Hilbert's Nurschel ansatz. So Hilbert says that if x is reduced, then the polynomial pt that we just defined is inside the ideal inside the ideal defining x remember this was defined by the coefficients of a degree 4 polynomial so there are five coefficients in a's and t's we defined the ideal of x to be generated by these coefficients of course, this is uh, not Hilbert's uh, Nullstell ansatz. This is what Hilbert's Nullstell ansatz implies in this case that any polynomial vanishing on the algebraically closed points of X is inside the ideal that you use to define X and provided X is reduced. And if it's X is not reduced, then the power of the polynomial would be there. So we'll get to that in just a second. So another way to phrase this is that there are polynomials, let's call them Q4AT through Q0AT inside of q a t such that this polynomial p t equals this sum q4 a t times c4 a t so this is a little bit more explicit version of this statement i find this still quite remarkable that we can combine these polynomials in such a way so as to eliminate all the variables a i j's and be left with a polynomial in just t. Okay, so geometrically, this makes sense if you believe the Hilbert's Nullstell ansatz. And this statement came with the hypothesis that x is reduced. If x is not reduced, then you'd have to uh, take a power of p for such a statement to be true. So a power of p would be in the ideal. Now, if x is not reduced and some power of pt is in ix, and this is believable, the statement really is saying something like p of t 
even if it vanishes in q bar points of x, it doesn't vanish on the fat points of x. So if x is non-reduced and there are these fat points that describes a little bit more than just the closed points of x, and that's why pt is uh, justifiably not in the ideal, uh, you'd have to take maybe some powers of these linear factors. And if you don't know what linear factor to take a power of, you can just take a power of pt. Okay, so there are two variations of this statement. Uh, both of them are useful, one of them conceptually, and um, both of them are useful actually because magma will understand the right, r the right language in these two interpretations. So again, assuming x is reduced, we say that the ideal, so all the polynomials that are generated by these coefficients, intersected with the polynomials only in the variable t is an ideal generated by the polynomial pt. So every polynomial inside of here is divisible by pt. And uh, let's elaborate on this a little bit. And one might even call this a proof. So the Hilbert Nurschelans that says that every polynomial vanishing on these uh, algebraically closed points of x are in i of x, and then this implies that i x intersected with q t is precisely the polynomials in t that vanish on x q bar. Namely, these are the polynomials that vanish on all the t-coordinates of the points on f x. So this is an ideal, and the ideals in polynomial with single variable have a single generator. The ideals So this polynomial ring is called a PID, principal ideal domain. So that the, this ix intersected with qt is divisible, every polynomial in here is divisible by this generator. And what is this generator? I'm claiming this generator is pt. And the reason is, so by this second statement that every polynomial in there is divisible by all of these t minus ti's for each coordinate ti appearing here. And therefore it is divisible by the product of these t minus ti's, and in particular by pt. So an important part of this proof was uh, this second step in interpreting what this intersection means in terms of the vanishing of on the t-coordinates of xq. In other words, I'm saying that what's important is not xq bar, but its projection to this a1 t axis. So I want to project these points to a1, and then of course I get these ti's, and then that's clearly the second interpretation. Let's call it variation two. If x is reduced, then its scheme-theoretic image. So it's we know it's set-theoretic image of its closed points, but I'm saying scheme-theoretic image, so with this non-reduced structure, if there was any. Scheme-theoretic image in A1 the one I denoted by a1t, is precisely the zero locus of pt. So zero locus or the zero scheme of pt. There's much, not much to say here. The map from x to the spectrum of qt, that's a1, if you were computing the image, would exactly be computed by this intersection ideal. But uh, this means that we can write down the map from x to a1 and ask for its image. And magma is also able to use this variation too, because you just ask, what is the polynomial inside of this ideal that is univariate with respect to t, and it will spit out pt. So both of these constructions, magma will understand, and both of them are useful conceptually. Let's make a slightly more advanced uh, remark here. This is super useful and applicable in much uh, greater generality. So the question you might have asked is, pt has coefficients in Q, but the Ti's were in defined over Q bar. I mean, is there any guarantee that P really has Q coefficients and why not Q bar coefficients? And it is in general true that the kind of constructions, these geometric constructions that we're doing will not change the base field. 
So remember, PT defines essentially the image scheme of X inside of A1. And this construction is well defined over Q, if you're thinking over Q. As we've seen, for example, this was pure algebra, I just computed this intersection. Basically, that statement requires this understanding here already, which is that X has additional symmetries just because it's defined over Q. So by being defined over Q, I mean the quartics I used were defined with rational coefficients, and therefore the ideal in X was generated by polynomials with rational coefficients. So that's what I mean by defined over Q. And X has these additional symmetries because there is this, on every Q bar point, I have the following ac Galo action. So the Galois group uh, corresponding to this algebraic closure acts on all, each of these points right, just by essentially permuting points of X. And then this means also the TI coordinates. So Gal Q permutes the TIs. So these TIs are the roots of the polynomial PT. And if PT uh, could not have been defined over Q, there would be a Galois action that would map one of the ti's to some other value that is not a root of pt. And of course the second statement and the last statement are contradictory. So the, the last statement says that the Galois group does not permute the ti's amongst themselves. So this is a contradiction. In other words, PT should be defined uh, over Q. And you can see the reach of this argument. You can uh, pretty much always do this. Whenever your polynomial is defined over Q or some number field or whatever, and then the Galois group of its algebraic closure will act on its uh, closed points. And from this, you can deduce the constructions that refer to all points at once will be invariant under the Galois action. And uh, therefore, the kind of objects that you construct from them will be defined over Q or, or over the base field. Okay, now that we have discussed what we are after, we are after these TIs. Essentially, uh, we've talked about how to get them, what they mean in, uh, in terms of an algebra. Uh, we can now go back and uh, compute them. That's what we're going to do in the next section.